anyway, again, thank you for the opportunity to share uh, with you a, a Lake Erie perspective uh, on phosphorus. And I understand that this group is historically more focused on the, the aspects of organic uh, sources of, of P. Uh, for this talk, I'm, I'm going to talk about P in general. Uh, in my mind, uh, P is P. The biggest issue with organic is the rate of is the rate rather than anything else. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about practices uh, associated just with phosphorus and what we're seeing in, in the uh, Western Lake Erie Basin. So just a little bit of an overview about, about the issues in the Western Lake Erie Basin. Our primary resource concern is nutrient transport and soil erosion. Typically, uh, agriculture looks, it's, it's row crop agricultural, primary corn and soybeans. But we do have some concentrated areas of animal agriculture, uh, specifically dairy, beef, swine, and poultry. And that's generally in the, uh, in the western part, uh, the southwestern part of the basin. What's unique about this area is the extensive network of systematic tile drainage. And uh, on the map on the bottom there, you can see the, the extent and sort of the bullseye in that northwest uh, corner of Ohio to where the, the large percentage of all the agricultural land is systematically tile drained. Between 1974 and 2012, uh, because that's the first time we got a question in the Ag Census regarding tile drainage, we saw an increase of about 22%. And if you look at just Ohio as a whole, approximately 46% of all those cropland acres are, are tile drainage. But what's unique is it, it's, you know, tile drainage was brought to, to this part of the region when the European settlers came in in the 1800s. But what's unique now uh, is the density. So we're going in and splitting tile. So we've got tile, subsurface tile now centered on 15 uh, feet centers. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's becoming a, a bigger issue. Uh, we also have very poor soil structure uh, and therefore we get a lot of preferential flow to that tile. You see in this bottom right picture, this is some work done by Martin Shipatalo, but this is a, this is a worm burrow going down to the uh, to a tile, but you can also see in these other pictures uh, just the, the fractures, uh, the desiccation drying, and then this is some smoke test where we go out and we put smoke in uh, or blow smoke back through the tile, and you can see the connections to the surface, and so anytime we get uh, nutrient applications on the surface, we have a, a conduit uh, that can be short-circuited and, and or move fast into the, into the tile drain and into the surface water. Another thing is we do apply a lot of nutrients on the surface and therefore we get a lot of stratification uh, in our systems. And so this is some work that's done, that was done by Dave Baker and Laura Johnson uh, looking at uh, 232 different fields. And you can see the, uh, the range in, or the stratification that occurs. We're looking at this in the median in that top one to two inches. These Malik 3 uh, soil test values are well above the agronomic level of about 25 to 30 parts per million. And then this is some, the, the red lines or the red numbers are those that exist just from our edge of field sites. Well, I'll, I'll explain a little bit uh, here in just a second. So we also have an issue of, of a lot of phosphorus buildup in our soils. And this was some work that we had done across some scales looking at the edge of field, uh, sort of, a, of the, the Portage River, but then the large Maumee Basin as well. And on the top graphs, you can see that nitrogen, when we get these large rains, nitrogen bleeds out of the system. We, we lose it. But we, what we see on the bottom three graphs is with phosphorus, with each event that we have, we still get a response of, of phosphorus. So phosphorus is persistent uh, and, you know, we need to be able to account for that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of legacy phosphorus in these soils um, and we need to be able to, to address that. So this was some work we did uh, with, with Doug Smith and, and Mark Williams. We went out and we, we just sitting across the table from farmers and different uh, stakeholder groups, we talked about what, what the problems could be, what could be leading to those harmful algal blooms. And this is just a list, this is an alphabetical order, but of uh, some things that we think hold merit. And so we've been now in the process of trying to address some of these. And so that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit about today is some of those uh, agricultural uh, issues, uh, particularly related to the, the uh, fertilizer placement and, and some of the 4R type things. 
um, as it relates to both the surface and the tile drainage. So when we think about what, what's causing uh, the problem and, and, how we, and how we make an impact on that, we can look at practices in the field, we can look at edge of field, and we can look at in-stream type practices. And so that's, what, that's sort of where our, our thought process has been. We feel that we can get more bang for the buck if we're looking at in-field practices, uh, but we're also uh, engaged in a little bit with edge of field practices as well. So this is our uh, the ARS Edge of Field Network in Ohio. We've got 40 paired fields located on 20 different farms. Uh, we've got approximately 100 automated samplers sitting out in the fields, and to date we've got roughly 400 site years of data. We use a Bakke design, this, this idea of the before-after control impact, to where we, uh, as we go into and work with a producer, we try to collect at least a crop rotation of baseline data and then we implement some type of a change on one of those fields, whether that be the placement of fertilizer, whether that's the, the use of drainage water management or a lot of other types of practices. And then we can uh, quantify then the impact of that specific practice. The three figures on the bottom there give you an idea of what a typical edge of field site looks like. We have both the surface and the tile flow uh, monitored uh, for those fields. We use H flumes at the surface and then we use uh, uh, Thelmar weir inserts into the tile drainage as well as area velocity sensors. Uh, one of the things uh, in this landscape is, as you can see, maybe a little bit in that bottom left figure is the flat landscape. So these are low gradient systems and tend to submerge pretty, fre pretty frequently. So some of the practices that we've uh, that are ongoing right now and, and some that I'll, I'll give you a little bit of data on here next is uh, specifically looking at the 4R, so looking at the impacts of organic versus inorganic, looking at rates, uh, whether we have a zero rate, a half rate, or full rate, uh, timing, looking at fall versus spring applications, and then surface versus subsurface. I showed the previous graph of the stratification and how do we start to address that. Uh, we've looked at, we've got a study ongoing uh, a little bit looking at gypsum as a surface amendment to bind up phosphorus. We've got cover crops and no cover crops, uh, tillage versus no tillage uh, or reduced forms of tillage, crop rotation. And I talked a little bit about the edge of field, this idea of drainage water management or, or artificially uh, controlling the, the tile elevations. Uh, outlet elevations. We've been looking at wood chip bioreactors and pea removal structures, and then also just the ditch designs. We've got some, some, a little bit of data on that now as well. So when we look at our data collectively, uh, what we see is, the, is from a concentration st standpoint, the surface concentrations, what we see coming off those surfaces in terms of the dissolved phosphorus is much greater than what we see uh, coming out of the tile drainage. That soil is acting as a natural filter as, as we would expect, and we're trying to get more interaction with that soil. The dotted line on there, there's a bi the binational agreement between the United States and Canada uh, for the Maumee River uh, suggests a 0.05 concentration. So that's just, that line there is for reference. But you can see that the, the surface uh, in both the March to July and the annual time frame is much is, is much more significant than, than what it is coming out of the tile. But then when we add the water amount into that, that's when it gets, it gets interesting. Because of these flat landscapes, we don't see a lot of, of surface discharge. And so most of our flow comes through the tile drainage network. And so we do see um, a significant amount more loading coming from the tile drainage uh, as opposed to the uh, through the surface. And again, those dashed lines are the same guidelines, that's for the Maumee River, but we've uh, projected that just to give a reference for the farmers to see where we are with, the, with our edge of field work. And right now, as I said, you know, roughly 70% roughly of all the phosphorus loading, of the dissolved phosphorus loading, originates from tile drainage. So we, we can't farm in these landscapes without tile drainage but uh, we do know that it's a significant pathway and we've got to come up with ways to address that. One of the other things we've done is tried to look at phosphorus budgets and these are by the sites and I've got these uh, broken up by uh, those on the left are from uh, 
farms that historically use inorganic sources, the ones on the right are organic sources. So uh, you can see there the, the general, the application rates are much greater uh, when we're looking at sites with organic uh, uh, sources of fertilizers, those two uh, inorganic. The other thing we've done is looked at soil test phosphorus. And one of the things that's interesting is, again, the two vertical lines there are, are the, the tri-state uh, recommendations in terms, of, in terms of critical level and, agri uh, and uh, maintenance levels. And you can see that soil test above those levels does pose an environmental risk, as the green arrow shows, but it does not necessarily equal an environmental risk. And those are some of the things that we're trying to understand now on these farms, what practices that these producers have in place uh, that allow them uh, to be able to uh, be below that threshold. So if we look at the, some of the practices, the 4R, the rates and, and source of, of fertilizer, uh, this is uh, some work that provided by Doug Smith and some surveys uh, in the Maumee Basin. Approximately 90% of the fields have P application at or below recommendations. 58% had zero application. But if you look at this X or the Y axis here at, at X equals zero, that's, that's where the issue is. And most of those are manure issues. We have a disposal. We have to be able to get rid of that manure. And so we're applying it on lands that really don't need any. The graph on the right is from a side-by-side -side experiment where we had equal rates of, of MAP and equal rates of, uh, with an equal rate of, of liquid dairy manure going on. And if we look at the treatment period, the, the, what I wanna point out here is, again, it gets to that rate issue. Manure is not the issue, it's the rate that the issue. When we apply it at the same rate, we see exactly the same losses. So manure is not necessarily the issue, it's a, it's a rate issue. We have a, we've done some studies looking at tillage and fertilizer placement. Uh, the risk of uh, tile drainage uh, losses, we see that no-till is greater than minimal till is, is greater uh, than deep tillage. But then that flips when we talk about surface losses. So that's our conundrum uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, so we feel like we need more integrated systems that include the, the no-till, the cover crops, and the nutrient management. And we've done this both at the field and the plot scale. Um, this is a study where we've looked at uh, cover crops uh, as, as well as a rate study. Uh, so we had a half rate of liquid dairy manure at 7,000 gallons per acre applied uh, to portions of it. And then we had a whole rate of 14,000 gallons applied. And this was with a mustard cover crop. And what I'll call your attention to is uh, the yellow boxes below. And this is just for a three month period. Note the difference in the nitrogen losses coming out of the tile drainage uh, with and without cover crops. There's a significant decrease in the amount of nitrogen that is lost from that system uh, with the cover crops versus the no cover crops. But with phosphorus, there was not as much. And so we've carried this on. Uh, we've carried this study on now. And this uh, is the full water year. We see that same uh, trend uh, still going on. We get about a a uh, 35% decrease in the total amount of water, 70, about a 75% increase in the amount of nitrate. And this is about a 33% decrease in dissolved phosphorus, but uh, we've also got other studies that show that actually we see a little increase in, in uh, dissolved phosphorus loss after cover crops. So what I'd say is with cover crops, uh, great for nitrogen, great from, from a water hydrology standpoint, but we've got mixed results right now with, terms, uh, with respect to phosphorus. The other issue, the other thing we're talking about, I talked a little bit about was drainage water management, looking at uh, some of that's where we tro control the outlet elevation. There's definitely a potential increase in surface discharge, but we do see uh, decreases in tile drainage discharge. There's some potential increase in surface DRP loss if we keep, get the, keep that system wetter and we get rains uh, quickly after that. Uh, the results on, on uh, dissolved phosphorus and tile drainage are mixed at this point. These systems are also used as an emergency stopgap uh, with liquid manure applications. They will drop the boards on these, and then if there is a, a fast flow process that occurs, they can take a pump truck out and they can pump out of these structures and keep that, uh, keep that liquid manure from going into the streams. We've also done a little work looking at uh, uh, gypsum uh, as a surface amendment. Uh, with respect to, um, this is a high soil test phosphorus site, uh, about 400 parts per million. We put a ton of gypsum on on two different occasions, and 
we did see significant reductions in both the surface or in the, in the subsurface phosphorus losses, both the dissolved and the total, but the magnitudes of those reductions were very small. So from a practicality standpoint, uh, it's, it's gonna take a lot more effort than, than, than gypsum, uh, but it does, it definitely has a place uh, in the system and can change the soil structure. So with that on the horizon, um, you know, we've got some other studies going on looking at the partitioning uh, of phosphorus transport between the incidental and the legacy sources. And I think this is, is critical. As I said, there's a lot of phosphorus out in these systems. We're doing some work on P removal structures uh, where we're using uh, arc, uh, arc furnace slag, other types of materials to absorb phosphorus as it comes out of the tile drainage. And then we're also looking at uh, some stacked and integrated practices. There's not, there's not a silver bullet. And I always say that there's silver buckshot. We're gonna have to stack a lot of these practices on top of one another in order to address the, the problems that we're having. And then finally, uh, the, the, the last slide here, I think we can't lose sight that weather plays a major role. And, and here in the Midwest, uh, where we are in Ohio this year was, was a really wet system. Um, and you can see on that bottom left graph, that was, that was four and a quarter inches of rain overnight, uh, and we did, there was no rain in the forecast. And so if we look at that top graph, we see that the exceedance probability is, is pretty great. So those top 20% of rainfall events are about an inch and a half to two inches, but they account for uh, roughly 60% of all the discharge and the uh, dissolved phosphorus that we're seeing come out. So I think the question as we move forward is how do we build resiliency to shifting climates into these conservation practices uh, that we're having. So with that, I will be done.